During the 1970s, cities across the US and Canada were awash with cocaine smuggled in through the port of Montreal by the Irish-Canadian criminal organization, the West End Gang. Police estimate that the gang brought in drugs with a street value of over $90 billion over a 15-year period. And they believe that the man who set up and managed the trade was Irish-Canadian criminal Frank Dooney Ryan. Montreal is uh, the oldest major city in Canada and uh, uh, starting uh, when the Italians were first moving here from Sicily, it was called Sin City. It was wide open. There were uh, after-hours bars, gambling casinos, which were totally illegal and uh, mostly run by the so-called Jewish Mafia. This would be in the uh, 30s and 40s and so on. It was a very wide open city. The Irish settled in a place called Griffintown and Point St. Charles mostly Griffintown at first, and uh, these were kind of shanty towns. Very poor, very working class. If you came from the point, either you're going to be a, a criminal or you're going to be a cop um, or a priest. That's kind of the way uh, Griffintown was. Anyone visiting here will tell you, uh, you know, I can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Catholic church. And a lot of that comes from both the French-Canadian side but also from the Irish side. It was into this melting pot that Frank Ryan Jr. was born on the 10th of June, 1942, into a family whose roots stretched back across the Atlantic to County Tipperary. It was here, on the streets of Griffintown, that Dooney Ryan would earn the nickname which followed him throughout his life. He mispronounced uh, as a two or three year old, uh, Junior as Juni, and uh, so his mother just started calling him Junie, and uh, then it got changed to Dooney, and uh, that's where he picked up the nickname. His father uh, bailed out when he was, I think, uh, three years old, and so he was raised as a single child by his uh, mother. One of Dooney Ryan's best friends was Billy McAllister, who would have had the same background as Ryan's family, poor and of Irish descent. They were out of control, and even as teenagers, were heavily involved in crime. He started getting into trouble, I guess, at 15 or 16 and started a small gang in that area, in the downtown area of Montreal. West End Gang is basically a bunch of young kids uh, that initially were involved in petty crimes. They were all of Irish descent, living in the western part of Montreal. And they were doing all these little petty crimes, thefts, bullying people, and so forth. He had a uh, cousin in Boston uh, called Peter White, who uh, invited them down to pull a big score. And so he and... Uh, uh, Billy McAllister and a couple of others uh, went down uh, to a town outside of Boston uh, where they uh, robbed a bank. At midday on the 24th of August 1966, Dooney Ryan, Billy McAllister and Peter White managed to steal over $50,000 from the Essex County Bank and Trust in the town of Lynn, Massachusetts. But what Dooney didn't know was that the American authorities had been keeping a close eye on him from the time he crossed the border into the US. And it didn't take them long to track him down. The FBI stages a raid at Ryan and McAllister's hideout. It's near a beach in uh, somewhere in Massachusetts and they go in heavy, they fire guns into the air, shout out the warning, storm in and arrest everybody. Ryan ends up getting 15 years. Maybe Ryan thought about that in prison and said, what am I doing this for? 50,000 isn't going to get me through the rest of my life. If I'm going to risk prison, if I'm going to risk wasting my life, why not make it worth something? Why not go after something big? Dooney spent the next six years in US prisons and was released on parole in the autumn of 1972. He was 30 when he returned to the streets of Montreal and there was no way he would be getting an ordinary job. His only experience was in the world of crime, and he had learned a lot in prison. 
he started going to the Cavalier Bar, where a lot of criminals of Irish descent hung out. When Frank Ryan uh, gets out of prison and the years that follow, it seems that that is the point where the, the so-called West End gang really does become a gang. In order to boost the West End gang's power and strength, Dooney Ryan knew that he would have to start at the bottom again. With the help of Billy McAllister, he assembled a group of criminals, and it wasn't long before the West End gang were making a name for themselves again in Montreal's criminal underworld. I, I became probably the best thief in Montreal because I could open any door, any lock. And Dooney, he went with gangs, and they'd rip off TV, jewelry. I mean, they were making big money. And the guys loved him because he shared with them. He wasn't the guy to hold back. You know, you, you were there, you got an end. Fair end, too. So give me that again. He started robbing um, jewelry stores. Got a bit of cash from that. He started lending that money out uh, to various of his uh, Irish pals uh, to pull off their own jobs at usurious rates. And you get to know a guy when he's... Brian was believed to be involved in laundering a lot of the money that, that from people who were pulling off these jobs. And he's looking to invest, and he's looking for a high return on his, uh, on his uh, investments. And uh, where do you go when you work in the underworld on that? You go towards drugs. Ryan, when he got into the uh, cocaine business, did make some connections with the uh, cartels in Colombia. He also had some uh, connection in Afghanistan. And then he established the connections with the Port of Montreal, which then was pretty well controlled by uh, a lot of uh, the Irishmen. Montreal is a hub. Organizations that want to traffic drugs either in Canada or in North America basically kind of utilize Montreal because of its geographical area and as well as its proximity to 300 million population in the United States. The importation of all illegal drugs was under the control of the Italian Mafia. But Ryan decided that he would like to get a piece of the action, as there was a huge amount of money to be made from it. Ryan knew a group of criminals of Irish descent who worked at the port. This gang was controlled by brothers Richard and Gerald Maddox. The Maddox brothers are very important. They started off as uh, guys who could uh, rob any truck, anything. Uh, they had extensive, extensive contacts at the port. The Jerry Maddox had such control of the port that not only was he helping them bring in um, the drugs and taking a, a percentage, he was also getting paid a huge amount of money to bring in these drugs, We're talking millions of dollars. The ports, oh, Irish, everybody to the nail. So they, they were all in it. Control the ports, you call it control area. They would arrange to uh, have uh, containers full of cocaine or uh, hidden maybe inside goods that were in the containers. The Maddox brothers, who were controlling the uh, port stand, uh, knew which container contained whatever uh, drug that they were importing. Jerry Maddox himself would say, uh, it was easy for me. All I had to do was uh, nod a certain way. I could get that container uh, put on a truck without anyone ever having to search it. That's power, that's huge power, especially when you're in drug trafficking. The container would be taken off the port docks and uh, delivered somewhere in Montreal, and the container would be open, and uh, sometimes there'd be uh, uh, a couple of hundred kilos of uh, cocaine in it. Now that he controlled the port of Montreal, Dooney Ryan had control over the city's drug trade, and he was now looking to position himself as a major player in Montreal's underworld. But he was disturbing the status quo. When Ryan is making his uh, ascent in Montreal's underworld, uh, at the same time, at that point, the Catroni family is quite well established in Montreal. They're the, the local leadership of the Mafia in Montreal. The Catroni family was basically seen as uh, controlling uh, most of the, uh, the rackets in Montreal, drug trafficking, loan sharking, extortion, things like that. 
The Italians weren't too pleased with the fact that uh, the Irish were muscling in on their territory, and uh, there were some veiled threats made against Dooney, but he just ignored them. Uh, with uh, a, his famous comment being uh, "Mafia, sh Mafia, we've got the IRA." There's a geography involved here as well. A lot of the Italians are in the northeastern end of Montreal, and that's where they control. That's their part of the city. Ryan's got his part in the west part of the city. Do they get along? Uh, it's hard to say. There was uh, often cooperation between uh, the West End Gang and the Italians because the West End Gang, uh, because of their connection with the Port of Montreal, were the ones able to get the uh, containers through. Ryan was prepared to work with anybody who could make him a profit. If they could make him money, he didn't care who they were. Dooney was ingenious, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, even a businessman, a good businessman, wouldn't have the forethought he had. Like, he, he was always a step ahead of them. Dooney was in total control at that time. Within the space of a few years, Dooney had become King Coke, and he started supplying drugs to the Hells Angels. You'll find them. The Hells Angels started off in California as war veterans, and uh, they were not so much a criminal organization then, but uh, then they became so, and uh, they uh, expanded all over North America, and uh, shortly after the war in 46, 47, they uh, came to Canada and established their first uh, uh, club here in Montreal. And they were active as of the late 70s, and they really started taking control of the drug distribution in Quebec and mainly in Canada. In the 70s, cocaine was the uh, drug of choice. There was no secret that uh, you could get coke in almost any bar in Montreal. At that point, cocaine is hugely popular across North America, and uh, the Hells Angels want in on it. They still weren't sophisticated enough yet to, uh, let's say, go to Colombia and meet with someone and arrange a coke deal. They were a large organization, they were a very dangerous organization, but they still needed someone like Frank Ryan to, uh, to supply them. He was called the King of Coke uh, because if you want to blow back in those days, Ryan was the guy to go to. His mastery seems to be at uh, getting the drugs in. If you're going to bring them in, you need people to distribute them. Do you want to be connected to the street dealers? Do you want to be connected to guys who are going to be rounded up every weekend by the cops? No. If, if it wasn't for Dooney, these guys would be bums. They used to hang around there. They had no money. They were bums. But Dooney put them to work. Bikers would deliver 15 boxes of this or 20 boxes of that. Dooney had it all. You wanted it, you had to get it from Dooney. He's known to the police as probably the person who, with the most money to finance a drug deal in Eastern Canada. That's how he's described. The police estimate that he's worth $50 million to $100 million at that point. They believe that uh, he's probably the most prolific uh, drug smuggler in Canada. He certainly was making money in the millions. He had a uh, large, luxurious house uh, right on the lake uh, in the west end of Montreal. He owned a yacht, but he certainly was a millionaire and uh, richer than anybody else in the uh, west end gang. He did get burned a couple of times, and uh, that's when uh, Ryan's nasty side came out. If somebody ever uh, uh, ripped him off, uh, whether they were Irish or uh, whatever, he didn't care. One of the people who did rip uh, Dooney Ryan off once on a, on a drug deal, actually a couple of times, uh, was a fellow by the name of uh, Patrick uh, Huey McGurnahan. He had gotten several warnings from uh, uh, about, he owed about $100,000 to Dooney for drugs that he appeared to be consuming more than he was selling. And after a couple of warnings, uh, Dooney Ryan decided to uh, get rid of him. Now that the Hells Angels were working for Dooney, he had no shortage of people who were willing to deal with problems like Huey McGurnahan for the right price. Dooney arranged a meeting with the most dangerous Hells Angel of them all, Eve's Apache Trudeau. Apache Trudeau at Montreal's Underworld became known as the most notorious uh, contract killer in Montreal and in Canada, probably. He later admitted to killing or taking part in the murders of at least 43 people. He was a big, tough guy, you know. He shot people for a living. You know, there was more to say. If he didn't like you or uh, somebody gave him enough money, he'd kill you. I met him in prison, too. He wasn't a nice guy. 
most people would have kept their eye open if her. Because if he'll kill anybody, he'll kill anybody. He was just, he was a homicidal maniac. On the night of the 17th of September, 1981, Huey McGurnahan arrived home and parked his car outside his apartment on York Street in downtown Montreal, where Apache Trudeau was waiting for him. His favorite method was uh, blowing up dynamite and blasting caps and things like that. And that became his preferred method of, uh, of getting rid of people, blowing up their cars, basically, or sometimes blowing up their apartments. Uh, McGurnahan uh, was leaving his apartment, which was on York Street in, uh, in Westmount, in the Westmount area of Montreal. And uh, Apache Trudeau had been very busy the night before placing dynamite under the uh, driver's seat of the uh, car. And he had a um, radio-controlled uh, detonator on his lap in his car. The killing of Huey McGurnahan sent a clear message to the authorities that crime in Montreal was getting out of control. The police had been trying to take down Dooney Ryan and the West End gang for years, but they could never build a solid case against them. The police were always after Ryan, and they knew that obviously, uh, you know, he was involved in crime, but he never got caught. He was never, the only time he ever spent time in jail was when he was arrested in uh, Massachusetts for that bank robbery. He never spent a day, day in jail in, uh, in Montreal. It's interesting that uh, most cops and most people who supposedly were members of the West End gang, like Billy McAllister has told me several times, no such thing as West End. But there was in the sense that uh, uh, they, they were a collective of, uh, of Irish people. And they were very loosely knit, almost like separate cells. There is somebody that kind of oversees everything, but he's not the president or anything like that, or he's not the chief. They all operate within themselves. So that's why it's hard for a police to say, okay, well, we're gonna, tomorrow morning, we're gonna go after everybody in the West End gang. Where do you start? The Cavalier Motel was where Dunny Ryan set up operations and police started busting it and uh, busting other places where they were. So they then ended up at Nidlow's, which was uh, just down the street from the Cavalier. But Nidlow's was his last base of operation. By this time, Dooney was rarely seen on the old streets of the West End and preferred to spend his time at his mansion on the waterfront. The business of running the gang had now passed into the hands of his partners, Billy McAllister and Alan Ross. And under their direction, a new generation of criminals came up through the ranks of the West End gang. A generation of brutal young killers. There was um, a lot of uh, jealousy building up against uh, Denny Ryan. There were other people in the gang, Alan Ross particularly, and McAllister to a certain extent. Wanted to be as powerful, if not more powerful, than uh, Denny Ryan. Denny, at the very end, had, uh, had a glass of cognac one night when I was there. And I finally got to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. He said, I wish I could get the fuck out of here. Just get out of the whole something scene. I don't want to be here. He knew it was getting too tacky. Anybody could kill anybody in those days. Some of them wanted him to get involved in heroin. And uh, so one story I've heard is that he, since he refused to do that, they thought he was kind of weak. Also, uh, they wanted to take control of the gang, especially Alan Ross. And so in uh, November 17th, 84, he was set up. He was at a, his favorite hangout, uh, Nidolo's Garden. It was a, a shady motel in uh, Montreal's West End. He apparently held a lot of meetings there, was often seen there. Uh, at one point, his uh, guy he trusted, Paul April, comes up to him and says, uh, I gotta talk to you, it's something very important. Other people saw this, uh, 
April I'll approach him and tell him we gotta go for a walk. Paul April had been hired from the stories I've heard by either McAllister or by Alan Ross to uh, to kill Donny Ryan. And there was Paul April and a uh, Lavalier, another gangster, who was hiding uh, in the bathroom of the motel room. By the time the police arrived, the King of Coke was already dead, and to this day, mystery surrounds who was responsible for his murder. Depends who you believe. McAllister tells me he had nothing to do with it, and uh, that Ross did it. And uh, Ross says he has nothing to do with it, but the cops think it was him, and uh, other people say that McAllister was behind uh, the setup. Both of them have denied it to me that they had anything to do with it but uh, the police are only theorizing that they did. The murder was never solved. In the 1970s, three Canadian criminals pulled off a string of daring bank robberies from Montreal to Miami. Over a 10-year period, Paddy Mitchell, Stephen Reed, and Lionel Wright got away with over $15 million in more than 140 bank robberies. But in September 1980, time ran out for the stopwatch gang. The three characters involved in this story are three of the most unusual human beings. They were all very pleasant, funny, fun, engaging, intelligent people. And that's what makes this such an unusual story. The story of the stopwatch gang begins in the Canadian capital city of Ottawa. It was here that the Irish-Canadian criminal Paddy Mitchell was born in 1942. Paddy Mitchell was a bon vivant uh, from a young age on. Uh, he was a very popular guy, uh, but he grew up in a, in a hard scrabble neighborhood. Paddy really got his sort of criminal beginnings as a sort of a, a bit of a small town rounder. Uh, he became known as the brains. If there was something to steal, Paddy could figure out a way for somebody else to steal it. Uh, he never did the stealing himself. There was a round table at the, uh, the corner of the Belle Claire Tavern where uh, Paddy used to meet with his, uh, his pals. People would come to him and say, uh, you know, we think there's a truck full of cigarettes somewhere, and Paddy would figure out how to make the truck disappear. Throughout this period, Paddy lived a double life. He lived with his wife, Joan, and his young son in a nice house in the suburbs and pretended to be a salesman. In reality, he was spending all his time in the Belclair Tavern, which is where he first met Lionel Wright and Stephen Reed. I thought the world of him right away, and uh, we became very close. And he was always really well-dressed and well-heeled and very soft-spoken and, and, and just a, a very charismatic guy. and, and absolutely someone that, I, you know, me as a young up-and-coming criminal looked up to. Started going to jail when I was 16. A lot of petty th crimes, a lot of drugs. Uh, it was the 60s, uh, you know, the period of LSD and those kind of things, and then quickly found harder drugs and, and harder times. and Became sort of a, a professional criminal at about 18 or 19. And started uh, throwing banks up in the air. and. Went to jail at 20 for 10 years uh, for a series of bank robberies in Toronto, in Ontario. Um, escaped in 73. That's when I met and hooked up with Patty Mitchell and eventually Lionel Wright. 
Lionel Wright was a very shy young man. Uh, he grew up as a, a, an A student, also grew up in, in uh, the Canadian capital. He was very quiet, he was very introverted, but he was also brilliant, and he was a details guy. Lionel's five foot six, maybe, you know, 130 pounds with rocks in his pockets. And never says a word, you know, he's, he's as solid as his floor we're standing on. He's the most fascinating guy in the world, he's just dependable, and he could remember the license plates of a car from two or three years ago. He could remember birth dates of old aliases, and so he was perfect that way. And he was always really well organized, where Patty and I both had the same, you know, sort of flamboyant kind of attitude of both careless with our money and the details of our lives. So he's really, you know, he was a caretaker of us too. Mitchell, Reed and Wright began working together immediately. It was in the Belclair Tavern that the seeds were planted for one of the biggest robberies in Canadian history. Gary Coutange, who worked for Air Canada, was introduced to Paddy. He told Paddy how relaxed security was on Air Canada when gold was being transported from the mines. He told us about this gold shipment that came in once a month for the mint and how it would be uh, often kept overnight in, in a cage at, the, at this little cargo depot. Oh, it kept in a cage. Yeah, it's got a little padlock on it. Cage with a padlock on it. Oh, gold shipment. Kept in a cage with a padlock on oh, it. Let's, let's talk some more about this. Any time that money or any valuables are being moved, there's always a lapse somewhere. Patty was good at this, like just to look at something and just to keep looking until that lapse happens. That's what he was amazing at finding. Patty Mitchell was the brains behind this and he had everything planned to the absolute second about how they were gonna pull this off. And the whole thing was gonna take five minutes from the time that the baggage handler that they had on their payroll would call and say that the gold shipment was in and it was being left overnight uh, in a storage area at the uh, Ottawa airport. Patty Mitchell made a call to the one security guard and said, have you seen um, uh, my guy who was supposed to come over and pick up a couple cans of Varsol? And he said, no, there's been nobody here. Will you tell him to get back over here, you know, or he's fired? At which point, Stephen Reed knocked on the door. I think Patty had called and said, my man, and screaming and yelling. The guy's open. The guy couldn't get the door open fast enough for me to say, you better get in here. Your boss is really mad at you, both of us. Of course, there's only me and him in there. So as soon as I got in, I just threw down on him. They were already neatly on little trolley for me, so that wasn't too bad. Wheeled them out to the car. And... The five bullions were worth $750,000 at the time, which is the equivalent of about $5 million today. It was easy to figure out that somebody knew had case the place out, and usually you use employees to do that. So we concentrated initially on all the people that worked in the cargo office. At that time, Coutanche was uh, suspected in some petty thievery, and uh, the information came about that uh, uh, he was involved uh, with Mitchell. After questioning him, we told him that. Uh, We'd be lenient on some other charges, uh, but if he gave us information, he worked with us, and that's how we got the whole of the, the whole gang. Mitchell, got him to wear a wire, and he started coming to meetings with Patty and got everybody talking, and uh, got enough conversation that went on for about 10 or 11 months. With Coutanch acting as their inside man, the police were able to build a case against the gang members. In March 1975, Reed, Wright, and Mitchell were arrested and charged with the robbery of the gold. Patty Mitchell's luck definitely ran out on the courthouse steps. He drew a judge and he gave them a total of 20 years uh, for what was really the first offense for Patty. Uh, and it was an extraordinary sentence for the time. But it also convinced Patty once he got into prison that he certainly was not gonna spend his entire adult life there and that his new project would be, how do I get out of here? Paddy Mitchell wasn't the only one planning on escaping. 
In October 1976, Lionel Wright escaped from the prison where he was being held. Although Mitchell and Reed were being held in a maximum security facility in Kingston, they were determined to get out as well. I was in Kingston Penitentiary, you know, it's got a 40-foot wall and really tight security, and there's very, been very few escapes. I think, I think the last escape out of there had been in 1943 or something. So it was a, it was a really tough place to get out of. But, you know, I looked, looked for spots on it, looked for different things, and we had had two or three aborted escapes, you know, thing, tunnels had collapsed on us and different things. They would take prisoners out on passes all the time, so I went out with a guard talked the guy into stopping afterwards and uh, at a restaurant and we sat down ordered fish and chips and I went to the bathroom and kept going. The prison authorities said hey wait a minute Lionel Wright escaped Stephen Reed just escaped everybody keep an eye on Patty Mitchell. Patty had something a little more elaborate in mind one evening, he took cigarette tobacco and making a, a concoction of, of really high-test nicotine that he sieved through a sock, uh, which he had read would, would imitate uh, a heart attack. Then he added about a three-mile run around the prison yard on top of it, gulped this stuff back, and um, uh, was so convincing he almost did kill himself. <laughs> As soon as he collapsed, one of the guys, you know, you know his, his brothers have all died of heart attacks. Died of so they, they rushed him right out in an ambulance, and as we do. We'll be all right. I'm going to get you there. They rushed him to hospital in Kingston, the nearby town to where the prison was. They used a specific hospital called Hotel View. So we just waited there. You know, some, some barricades. At the emergency ward, we just dropped some barricades, so they came around the side, followed the signs. He pulled up outside, and they yelled to two orderlies who were standing outside, come and help, we've got a heart attack victim. Right here, man. Oh, President Gregson. Well, I think it's just what you do, huh? You, you go get your friends, I mean, it's... You're, you know, they're, Patty and I were, were part of something, and we're, you know, we were, we were partners, and it's what you do. With Mitchell now out of prison and the old gang back together again, they decided to cross the border into the U.S. But freedom for them came at a price. They were now fugitives on the run and could never go back to their old lives. I think when we first went away, it, it was really, really difficult for him. I'd find him fishing on, you know, down in St. Petersburg. He'd gone into a deep depression is what it was, you know, if I look back at it. And it was over knowing. It was him coming to terms with it, that he wasn't going to see his wife and his son again. He had been married to Joanne. It was his sweetheart, you know, since they were kids. I think they were together since they were 18 or 19. And uh, he had a son, Kevin. I don't think the reality of that it was a complete break from them ever settled in on him before he came out because there were several times where he had started to make moves to meet with Joanne and I said well you know you, you do that you put the rest of us at risk our agreement was we're we're going on here we're, we're going to cross the 49th parallel here and then as soon as we have enough money we're gone for good and you know we're, we're going to become someone else and that, you know, that life is dead behind us. And I said, you're going to have to come back to work. Life as a fugitive was a very different thing than sort of getting together with your friends at the local tavern. They had to be somebody else. They had to have aliases. It's not easy to actually be somebody else. They had no papers. They had no um, way of getting real jobs. So then they thought, well, how complicated can it be to hold up a bank? When the three members of the Stopwatch Gang started planning to rob banks in the U.S., they realized they could leave nothing to chance. All raids had to be meticulously planned. They all shared the job of planning and timing the raids, and they found 
they had a real gift for it. Patty would plan this out second by second, and Lionel would know how many steps it was from the curb to the bank, to the teller, to the vault. All of those things they would plan out methodically. First place that you find are the police stations. And then you start looking for accessibility, mostly for approach. We can park here, we're off the street there, police station's a mile and a half away, and then you leave it all and go to another city and do the same thing, and then you leave that all and you come back and then, then we all sit together and talk. Okay, well, that, that one, the, that Bank of America up on Wilshire has that back entrance and they've got six tellers, that central teller has all the hundreds, so okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> majority of our scores, you would use a full-on mask. Dead president's masks and, you know, full sort of Darth Vader, you know, kind of costuming things. One of them would always wear a stopwatch, supposedly to time this thing to the second. And usually it was Stephen Reed, and half the time Stephen Reed even forgot to start the thing in all the excitement. But what it did do, of course, is it told the FBI every time these guys would show up in the bank film, oh, it's the stopwatch gang. Their notoriety, in fact, came from the stopwatch and also the size of the robberies that were taking place. These guys were, were routinely doing hundred, two hundred thousand uh, dollar uh, robberies. And the more they did, the better they got. The FBI said we'd done about 140 robberies down there. They may be a little bit low. Anyway, we've done a lot of bank robberies. We didn't shoot anyone. We didn't hit them over the heads with guns and all that sort of stuff. There are very few bank robbers I think that have ever made the money that we've made. We made 12 or 15 million dollars over, you know, a few short years and, uh, um, and went through it. I mean, literally, when we'd go to Las Vegas and we'd lose so much money in the casinos and spend so much money just partying. I mean, you could never pick up a bill or, you know, bar tab or buy a drink or anything when you're around us. Lionel never really had any habits. He had gold watches. You know, he'd spend like twenty, thirty thousand on a gold watch. Guy would worry about everything. One time we had so much money we didn't know what to do with it. And I looked at him and I said, Lionel, what a nice problem to have, huh? As they adopted to life on the run, there were tensions among them, and usually it was Patty uh, that was causing the tensions. Patty loved to party and uh, he loved the girls. He loved the idea that he could just be anybody that he invented on the spot. And now he had the money to sort of go along with the act. The problem with that was that the more lies he told, the more that someone was likely to become suspicious if they noticed something wrong with one of his lies. Lionel and I'd get really pissed off at Patty, running around smoking cigars and bringing attention because we were just kind of settling down. Patty and I, when we got to America, we kind of switched places. He became the, the hardcore partier, and I had a girlfriend, and I wanted the, the, mess, the thing that he'd had before, which was a marriage and a son and sort of, you know, just a quiet domestic place to go to in life. As Paddy Mitchell became more and more consumed by drink and drugs, Stephen Reed took a step back, started thinking more about the future, and began to look for a quiet spot where the gang could retire to when the time was right. They rented a beautiful house uh, in the Arizona um, Grand Canyon area, and that became their hideout. They spent a long time in Oak Creek Canyon, in fact, they got to know local police officers and became quite good friends with them, pretending they were big shots from the television and music industries. I can remember being in Arizona, living up in this canyon, and big house, you know, big, in the middle of the Ponderosa Pines with, you know, a fireplace I could roast a Volkswagen in, you know, and sitting there with a dog and a, a beautiful woman and, who loved me in an airplane. And, uh, and motorcycle, and of course, thinking and you know, and really enjoying my life and knowing at another level that you know this isn't going to last. That, that you know this is going to this is going to come to an end, and it's not going to be pretty. So 
So they decided to do one last big score, and they went back down to uh, San Diego, uh, and they planned what became um, the biggest bank robbery in California's history at that time. The gang planned to hold up the Bank of America in San Diego during a delivery of cash from an armored car. But because of the stopwatch gang's exploits, security had been tightened in banks all over America, and the gang knew that this job wouldn't be a simple smash and grab. This time, Paddy Mitchell would wait outside the bank in a getaway car, whilst Reed and Wright went inside to carry out the robbery. Stephen Reed and Lionel Wright went into the bank dressed as two businessmen. Slightly odd-looking businessman. Uh, Lionel had a, a goatee, glasses, a long blonde wig on, uh, and a, a pale suit. Stephen Reed was um, sort of lounging in the loans department in a, a natty blue suit, but he had a, a very thick uh, black beard, mustache, and it was kind of a this nose and a pair of glasses protruding from a lot of hair. Unfortunately for them, on that particular day, uh, the armored truck delivery was late. We had to sit in that bank for quite a while, close to 20 minutes. I don't know how anybody let me sit there for 25 minutes looking the way I did. Finally, the truck arrived. The guard brought in a, a trolley full of coin. And then uh, finally, after about three trips, taking the, the mother load out, which was $283,000 in cash in three bags. Don't move. Down. OK, folks, this is a rubber. Down there. It was a very, very quick robbery. We were out of there quite quickly once he kicked off. From the time we threw the bank up in the air till the time I walked out the door, it was like 10 or 15 seconds, but we had been in the bank about 20 minutes. Reed and Wright walked out of the bank with $283,000, the largest bank robbery ever committed in California at the time. The gang made their getaway and headed back to Arizona, but in their haste, they made a costly mistake. As bad luck would have it, a homeless person going through the dumpster found the bank bags and thinking that there might be a reward, took them to the police. And from those bank bags, the police had uh, the first set of fingerprints of two members of the uh, stopwatch gang. They got evidence from that robbery, but they still didn't know who they were after. They had nothing, they couldn't link it to anything. And then they got an informant uh, a guy who we knew from Canada, he got caught up in a meth lab up in Borrego Springs, and uh, he said, uh, he traded us, he said, uh, I'll give you the stopwatch gang, and they jumped, they jumped all over that. The police soon learned the whereabouts of the stopwatch gang. On October 31st, 1980, they arrested Stephen Reed and Lionel Wright at their hideout in Arizona. Paddy Mitchell was nowhere to be found. Mitchell continued robbing banks, but two years later, the police caught up with him for the last time. He ended up spending the rest of his life behind bars, dying in prison in 2007. Lionel Wright became eligible for parole in 1994, but by now was accustomed to prison life and decided to remain in the prison system and work as a clerk. Stephen Reed turned to writing during his time in prison and published a well-known book based on his life as a bank robber. It was through his writing that Stephen Reed would meet his future wife, poet Susan Musgrave. Well, I, I got Stephen's manuscript, I think it was in the fall, in fact, I read it on Halloween of 1984. And I wrote to him the next day, and I probably said, would you marry me, the second day I wrote. Then we met and began visiting, and we fell in love, and we decided to marry in prison. I got out, me, me of 87. We moved into a little cottage by the sea and had a great life for about 10 years. And then uh, I lit my life on fire again. Got back into drugs and stuff and committed a bank robbery by myself that was terrible. And I got another 18 years and I just finished that. Did 10 of that and for whatever reasons of her own, my wife stayed with me. I'm so happy that I can be with him and when he is well and functioning because a lot of our life has been pretty turbulent because I do get very angry when I see him returning to any kind of addictive behavior because I, I'm really threatened by it, because the fear is that he'll 
You lost to me again. 